Ezekiel. Oh, actually, um, yeah, let's, let's go to uh, Ezekiel. And um, like I said, we are um, sort of taking a little, uh, a little side path from studying the four types of spirits that are uh, mentioned in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. We know, we, we just know by knowing the Bible that Satan definitely falls into that category. He is a prince. Uh, he is, uh, in fact, that's what we're going to see here in Ezekiel 28. And um, he qualifies as a principality, a power, ruler of the darkness. If, if Christ is the greater light ruling over the day, Satan would be the lesser light ruling over the night. Hi, folks. How are y'all? I didn't see you come in, so I thought I'd say hi. Yeah, huh? Alan and Nancy. Al. All right. Glad you came. Uh, Ezekiel 28 is where we're going to start. So anyway, he's uh, the ruler of the darkness of this world and, and responsible for spiritual wickedness in high places. All of that falls upon uh, he's called the devil, he's called the serpent, the dragon, Satan, um, Belial, Leviathan, Beelzebub, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, roaring lion, what else? Father of lies, he said dragon, father of lies, Lucifer, Isaiah 14, yes I did, thank you very much for that. So we'll start in Ezekiel 28. That sort of goes in line with um, we've been, what we've been studying as far as principalities goes. And uh, something to consider, uh, and this is something that uh, I didn't really catch on to early, in my earlier years, reading different commentaries, they all say, this, everybody says this is Satan, but it's not Satan, it's the prince of Tyrus, the king of Tyrus, and so on. So it's only speaking of this earthly ruler. But if you look at it, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It, there's no way that the prince of Tyrus was in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there's no way that the, the prince of Tyrus was a covering cherub with God. And so it is obviously referring to something higher than just this earthly prince. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. So ask God to open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to his word tonight and give us some understanding on who exactly our adversary is. Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the rain that you sent our way. And uh, we thank you for this word tonight, Lord, that uh, you've given to us. Uh, we can't see the devil. I don't know that I'd want to in this world. Uh, but, Father, we can through the pages of Scripture know his, his power, but also know his limitations, where he came from, what happened uh, when he fell, why did he fall, what is he here to do, and um, Lord, we just uh, thank you, God, that you've included everything uh, in, in all the scriptures, Lord. We have everything that we need to understand our enemy, uh, to understand his power, his personality, and eventually, Lord, we'll see his complete and total demise. We look forward to that day. So, Father, we ask you, God, to just guide us in our thoughts and in our study uh, of your word. Help us, dear God, to know what's right. We pray this in Jesus' name and amen. Uh, let's start in Ezekiel 28. That's what I have up on the screen. The word of the Lord uh, came again unto me, saying, uh, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus, and, and this is where, uh, like I say, the scholars, they blew it. They say that this is only applied to an earthly uh, leader, but knowing the language of the scriptures, knowing uh, what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, that we're looking for principalities, because that's who we're wrestling against. And certainly, 
Let's say, let's, and, and I do believe that there was an earthly man who was the king over Tyrus, okay? Or Tyre, T-Y-R-E. Um, there obviously was. But does that have any bearing on us today? I mean, do we still have to face against this evil prince of Tyre? No, it, it's, he's dead and gone, and not, we're not affected by that in any way. So obviously then, the, the bulk of this is going to be dealing with uh, the spirit that was above him, the prince who ruled through this earthly prince of Tyrus. There's no doubt in my mind that the earthly ruler saw himself as a god. So many leaders of people across the years have considered themselves to be a god. Um, Caesar, often the Caesars were gods over the people. Uh, the emperor of Japan was a, they referred to him as a living god. That's why they started World War II, was in his name. I don't know how much he had to do with it, uh, but they considered him a living god. And one of the things that the United States demanded of Japan in the, uh, at the end of the war, when they surrendered unconditionally, they said, excuse me, sure they did, but the thing that they demanded of him was, you're no longer going to be seen by the people as a living God. You must renounce your quote-unquote deity, and that's what he did. And so anyway, um, so we have, Son of Man saying to the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, but notice it's capital G. That means that God takes this personally and that the prince of Tyrus, who we will see is the anointed cherub and it was in the Garden of Eden, this prince of Tyrus is bound and determined to cause everyone to think that he is God. The parallel passage to this is 2 Thessalonians 2, and it says almost the same thing. Uh, that concerning the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that's what you have here. He says, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. When I look in Revelation, and I don't have this up on the screen, but when I look in Revelation chapter 5, no, chapter 4, John is actually looking up into heaven, and uh, he, uh, a door is open in heaven, and there's a voice of a trumpet saying, Come up hither. In verse 2 of Revelation 4, and Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. This is God's seat of authority. One sat on the throne. And he that sat upon was to look like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. In sight like unto an emerald. That matches uh, what was seen in Ezekiel chapter 1. That along with the, the four living creatures of the four beasts. Uh, and you have the 24 elders and so on. But concentrate there in this context, on the throne that was set in heaven. And we see that that's what the devil is concerned with. He says, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. So where is the throne of God? Number one, we just saw in Revelation 4 that it's in heaven. Is there a similar place where God has his throne? In your heart. Okay, so take this personally, that the devil seeks to sit in your heart and rule from your heart. You know what? I am going to go to 2 Thessalonians 2. I can't get by without it. Um, he says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the 
temple of God. And in the New Testament, the only reference to the temple of God was either the throne that was in heaven or the, the, the human body, literally the heart, the temple of God. Know ye not that your body is the temple of God. And so to me, that's the only um, allowable um, definition of what the temple of God is. There's a lot of people say that um, the Antichrist is, or, the, or that people are going to build another temple in Jerusalem. And uh, I say that if they do, Christ certainly won't have anything to do with it because he does not dwell in temples made with hands. And so um, I do believe that he is, in, in this verse here, he's referencing the heart of mankind. So, so think about that for a minute. As we look back in Ezekiel 28, uh, where he says, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Your heart being in the midst of the pericardium, that sack of water that surrounds your heart with the four chambers in it, which are the four living creatures. And um, he literally wants to rule out of your heart. Some days... It seems like he does. Seems like he's there on some days. I don't like them. I don't like when those days come. I don't like uh, some of the things that devil puts into my heart. I don't like them at all. Uh, but that's his attempt at drawing all of us back away from, his, from God's word, back away from God's people, back away from... Uh, Christ's church, and so on, is that the devil believes that he can still enter into your heart and take over. Now, God doesn't share his throne with anybody or anything. And so you cannot, that's why Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and wealth, you cannot serve God and money. Uh, we know the love of money is the root of all evil, and Satan definitely is involved in that. Uh, to me, it's just, it's always funny when you study Satan out in the scriptures, you find out that he likes gold and silver and money and trafficking and riches. And I'm like, but you're an angel. Okay? No, he likes it. And that's what he wants. And though you can tell when people have the devil in their heart because that's all they care about is money, 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 money. But anyway, now God says at, at, in the halfway through that verse again in verse 2, yet thou art a man and not God. Well, are we talking about a spirit? Or are we talking about a, an earthly prince? Well, let's... Keep our place here in Ezekiel 28, and let's go to Isaiah. Uh, the gentleman here did mention Lucifer, so Isaiah 14. Let's see what it says here. Verse 12. Actually, I want you to go back a little bit. Verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. And we know that Satan is going to be cast into hell, the bottomless pit. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. Uh, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Verse 10, all they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? In other words, here's the devil. He's cast into hell. And all the people that are in hell, especially the kings, look at him and say, did you lose something here? Did you lose your power? Did you lose uh, your spirithood or whatever? You are as weak as a mortal man is. So, again, how can we reconcile that? Well, Psalm 82 is how you can do it. Actually, the scripture's doing it. Uh, 
uh, while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Does the devil know the Bible? Yeah. His problem is, however, he knows it, but he doesn't believe it. And he can't believe it. He can't, he can know the verses, but he can't actually understand that some of those verses are referring to him and his demise, but he, he can't believe that. He is still working against God, and we know in the days of the book of Revelation, in the valley of Megiddo, the battle of Armageddon, he gathers all the uh, nations of the world, he gathers the beast and the false prophet, and they're going to make war with the Lamb and his saints. That's going to last 0.025 seconds, as far as I'm concerned. It's going to go by very quickly, okay? Because Jesus just, he's going to overpower him. But anyway, in Psalm 82, verse 6, God said, I have said, ye are gods, little g, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the... Look at there, it says princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. So right here in Psalm 82, 6 and 7, we find out that uh, I would say probably all of the evil angels that are cast out of heaven in Revelation 6, Revelation 12, and so on, um, all of them are going to be part of the second death when it says they shall die like men. And we know the second death is the lake of fire, and we know that they're all cast into the lake of fire, and that's everlasting death. And so to become weak and mortal like men is contained in Scripture. We see it in Isaiah 14, and I'll keep reading there. Verse 11, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. What's a vial? Yeah. So, now we have three instruments. And we'll look at the other ones in Ezekiel 28. The devil has built in musical instruments. Uh, right here, a vial, some sort of stringed, bowed instrument. And there's different versions of them. You have the violin, viola, the cello, the bass. And they may have had some in Old Testament days, but he has that built into his body. Meaning, the devil knows music. Does he use that knowledge? Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, I watched an interesting video over the weekend. Uh, it only lasted like 30 some odd minutes, but man, it was full, chock full of all these rock stars that admitted that they made a pact with the devil. And um, uh, like, um, oh, now I can't remember any names. Um, Katy Perry, who said that. Um, Famous folk singer. Oh, I can't think of anybody's name now. I should have wrote them down. Uh, Beyonce says that when she goes out on stage, a devil takes over her called Sasha Fierce. And she turns into this character. Literally, it just takes her over. Um, I remember that there was watching an interview with one of the guys from the band The Who... And he said, we get out on stage, we start playing, and he said, something just takes over. And he said, I can play things like that that I never could play in practice. He said, it's given me a power to sing and to play things that are just about impossible, but they're doing it. Uh, and he said, if you were to come out to me while I'm there on stage and try to mess with me, he said, I'd probably end up killing you. It just takes him over. Well, there's a reason why the devil takes over, or devils take over all these rock and roll people, 
who are singing this music. It's for a reason. That music has the ability to carry whatever, whatever lyric they're trying to say or whatever meaning behind that song and drive it into these people that listen to it. It doesn't matter if it's heavy metal, hard rock, southern rock, rockabilly, rap, soul, doesn't matter, okay? Um, the devil just, he's taken over the world with music, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm picturing in my mind this picture of, uh, oh man, I shouldn't even say anymore now. I can't remember anybody's name. But he was a, he was a pop singer, uh, was a kid, and now he's an adult. Just, Justin Bieber gets lowered down on the stage. He's got these big wings that he's wearing, and those wings are made up of all kinds of musical instruments. Huh? Yeah, now the, now the people watching this, they probably don't get it. But I took one look at it, and I said, well, that's Lucifer. And uh, there's his vials. He's got violins in there and everything. You could probably look this up uh, on your phone. Matthew, why don't you do that? Look that picture up on your phone. Um, anyway, let's go to verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And uh, almost all the modern Bibles take Lucifer out and replace it with Morning Star. That's, yeah, I know, God. It makes me mad, too. Okay? Um, Satan is not the morning star. Jesus is. But that's what, and they insist that. They say that's what it means. Uh, you know, there's, uh, all, there's no meaning behind the Hebrew word, Haleo, that means Lucifer. I'm going, uh, well, ask the devil worshipers. They know who Lucifer is. Ask Anton LaVey, who started the first church of Satan in uh, San Francisco, 1969, you remember the lyrics to Hotel California? And he said, please bring me my wine. And she said, we haven't had that spirit here since 1969. That's what it was a reference to, the first church of Satan. Uh, and he believed that Satan was Lucifer. Aleister Crowley did. All of the occultists and Satan worshipers know who Lucifer is. It's the Bible scholars who don't. They got a problem. Oh, Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, which are angels. I will sit also, and here it is, upon the mount of the congregation. That's this church, and that's that church, and that church, and that church. Anywhere the congregation is, he seeks to sit above the congregation, the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north, or in the north side, which we know, according to Ezekiel and Jeremiah, is heaven. It's in the north. And he says, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that matches then what we are looking at in Ezekiel 28, going back to that, where he says, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So all of this is going to fall upon Satan, Lucifer, where he's going to exalt himself and attempt to take over heaven, which is why in Revelation 12 there's a war in heaven. Michael didn't start the war. Satan did. But Michael's going to finish it. Amen. Amen. Now look at verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Now, the devil's knowledge and his wisdom cannot be denied here. He has it. And it says there is no secret that they can hide from thee. And then he says, now this is how the wisdom is applied by the devil. Uh, Solomon, when God gave Solomon his wisdom, Solomon applied it to the 40 years where he was king, where he had all this money and he had all these women and he had all this music and wine and parties and a big house and everybody bowing to him, including kings from other nations. 
Uh, he applied that to his life and he writes the book of Ecclesiastes and he said, my wisdom tells me that all of that stuff was vanity. It was a waste. But look at what the devil does. Verse 4, with thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. He is a money-hungry fool. He likes Shiny things, we're going to see that in verse 10, no, verse 13. Um, but he, he likes money, he likes uh, profit, he likes increase, he likes gold and silver. Verse 5, by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic. Well, that word's used even to this day. How's it applied? Drug trafficking, human trafficking. Um, I watched, I think it was Josh Hawley and who else, ask somebody who was from, I don't know if they were from the heart, uh, Homeland Security or something that had to do with the border. There's somebody that Biden put in. Huh? No, it wasn't him. It was a woman. And they, of course, these people never answer the question. But they asked them, how many children that have come across the border are now unaccounted for? And that, that lady knew the answer. And she would not answer it. And finally, he said 65,000 children that have come into this country in the last three and a half years that you cannot account for. You don't know where they are or what happened to them. And I'll, I just, I do believe that very, very powerful people in this country, including probably some elected officials, are part of that. I can tell you, in Kenya, the first time I went to Kenya, um, Michael and I, Michael, you remember this, we were out in um, uh, his hometown where his mom and his grandma lived, Kitali, and we went out just preaching in churches all day long. And I'd get done at one church, he'd take me to another one, I'd preach there and so on. And um, on the way back to where we were staying, it was, it was late already, it was dark, and we came upon a roadblock, and Michael said, they're going to search our car. And I said, how do you know? He said, because we're driving a new car. We had rented it. We were driving a new car. And he said, uh, generally, the only people that have new cars like this in Kenya are members of parliament. And he said, um, the people who are more likely to be moving drugs around our members of parliament in these new cars. And sure enough, when, they, when we pulled up there, they took a look at the car, told Michael, open the trunk. They looked in the trunk, looked in the back seat, looked at me, eyes were like this big around, I was going, are we in trouble? Michael said, no. And uh, they said, okay, you can go. But he was dead on. And that made me mad when I heard that the parliament guys are all smuggling drugs all throughout the country. And it's worse than that. So if it's happening somewhere else in the world, and I know it for a fact, America's not immune anymore. We're not the good guys. Okay? Not our politicians. We're not the good guys. And that stuff is going on, and they're trafficking drugs, trafficking humans, but especially trafficking children. What do you think Jeffrey Epstein was up to all those years? Okay? He had, a, he had a, a thing for young girls, and so in order to make sure he never got in trouble because of it, he started flying all these people out to his island where those young girls were. He could have very well been. He was Jew. I know that. Epstein's Jewish, and um, nobody in their right mind thinks he hung himself in prison. 
No way, no how. All right. Now, uh, verse 5 again. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. <gasps> I just got a text message. Somebody tried to kill Trump again. Somebody look that up. Okay. All right. I think we can expect that. Do what? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, behold, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. They shall defile thy brightness, and they shall bring thee down to the pit. That is exactly what Revelation says. He is, the angel is going to come open up the pit. You're going to take Satan and cast him down in there. Now, look in verse 12. Son of, let me uh, switch here. Moreover, the word of God, word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So, one of the things that we know about the devil before his fall was that he was he was absolute beauty if there ever was something that was beautiful it would have been lucifer in this in these days before his fall and so he is perfect in beauty he's full of wisdom and so uh it says later on in verse 14 thou art the anointed cherub that covereth so he had what I think was the highest position of all angels in heaven. I think he was the, the number one. And so, verse uh, 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, that matches Genesis 3. We know that. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Now there's ten here. Ten represents what? Dominion. He's going to be the boss of somebody, okay? But look at these, look at what he's covered with. Remember the name in Isaiah is Lucifer, which means what? Light bearer. Now take a look at these stones. What is it these stones do? They reflect light. Or they, they take it in and give it oomph, give it color. Amplify, good word. Okay? All of them bear the light. All of them do. So is that name wrong? No, they got it right. He's not morning star. Amen. He's not that. He, he is Lucifer. And, and if you ever doubted it, just read verse 13 again. Of all of these stones, these ten stones that are covering him. And I mean head down to his feet. Uh, who remembers the old Battlestar Galactica TV show? Remember that, Chris? Okay. The Cylons, the, you know, the robot things, okay? And they were controlled by who? Hmm? Lucifer. Yep. There was a, there was a, a chief artificial intelligent robot that controlled all the Cylons, and his name was Lucifer. And when you saw him, you can pull this up too. Just type in Battlestar Galactica Lucifer and you'll see that he's shiny and he's reflecting all these lights and stuff like that. Ring a bell now? He's got this little 
this cape on with the big collar in that, okay? It's ama amazing what I remember from childhood, yeah. But the guy who wrote the script and who started the show, Battlestar Galactica, was a Mormon. And it's about Captain Adama Adam and 12 tribes of people leaving the planet Kolob in search of Earth. And they finally find Earth. And that's the, that's the Book of Mormon. Yeah. It's crazy, I know. Anyway. Uh, then look at the last half of verse 13. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes. Now, that's not a meth pipe. Was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So we, have, we saw vials in Isaiah 14, and now we see tabrets, which are percussion instruments, and pipes are like a pipe organ or uh, any kind of, of um, oh, how, would you, how would you, the woodwinds and the brass instruments, I think all categorized as piped instruments. Uh, because basically you have a pipe either made of wood uh, or of metal, whether it's a flute, a clarinet's made of wood primarily, um, and then you have the brass instruments. Uh, they're all pipes, basically, and you buzz your lips in them, and that makes these sounds and so on. Uh, the reed instruments, that's what I was trying to think of, the oboe, the clarinet, saxophones, things like that, all of those are pipe instruments with a reed on there, and... Um, so you have, you have the vials, you have percussion with the tabrets, and then you have all of the piped instruments and the organ. Incidentally, I, th I think I mentioned this here a while back, but when I went into the House of the Temple Lodge, which is the Grand Masonic Lodge in Washington, D.C., 13, uh, 13 blocks exactly from the White House. Yeah, a straight in a straight line. 13 blocks up is this big, humongous Masonic Lodge. And they take you, I mean, they'll take you and show you everything in there. And you go into this big lodge room, it's huge. And they have an altar here with five different religious texts. They have the Bible. They have the Tanakh, which is the Jewish uh, Old Testament. They have the Bhagavad Gita, which is uh, Hindu, I think. They have the Koran. I can't remember the other one. But if like, boy, if you were looking for God, surely you'd find one in there, okay? And you, and you knelt in front of that. When you were being initiated, you had to kneel in front of that. You had to give homage to it. But anyway, on, the, on one wall, they had the uh, Worshipful Master's Throne, which was 33 feet high, exactly, and then on the opposite of that, I was looking at that and I'm going, what in the world? It's up in the balcony. They had a humongous pipe organ. And I'm just looking at that and I'm going, what in the world is a pipe organ doing in a Masonic Lodge? I'm going, I feel like I'm in church or something like that. And then it dawned on me, the workmanship of thy pipes. And they play that. And there are hymns that Masons sing to the great architect of the universe and so on. And somebody up there plays that pipe organ while they guys down here singing. And their wife knows nothing of what they do in there. Not one thing. Never tell your wife what goes on in the lodge. Ever. In fact, that copy of Morals and Dogmen that I have, the front page with the title on it is stamped. Esoteric book. For uh, Scottish Rite eyes only to, re to be returned upon death of the recipient. So the widow, if her husband dies and he's a mason, she has to gather up his lambskin apron, his medallions, his copy of Morals and Dogma or anything else and have to turn it back into the lodge because they don't want everybody reading that book. They don't because it has their secrets secretly embedded in there. Uh, but anyway, now look at verse 14. So we know the devil uses 
music. We know he does. Um, and I'll say this, even so-called Christian music, so-called Christian music, um, if it's not sung by Christians, written by Christians, it ain't Christian. That's the way I look at it. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So, what do you think that means? Anointed cherub that covereth. What's he covering? Huh? Mercy seat? I think so. We know that now there are two cherubs that bring their wings over because the Bible talks about God who dwelleth between the cherubims. And uh, we know the, the, the making of the Ark of the Covenant had these two great big cherubs with their wings covering the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And so from that we get the idea that it's very possible that Lucifer covered all of that uh, and was the anointed cherub by God. Now, think about coveting. When you covet something, it's generally something that you see. Okay? So if you pass by a guy's house, he's got a brand new car, and you're going, oh, he's got a new car. Wow. And all of a sudden now, you want a new car. You covet those things, okay? Or somebody builds a new house. Um, Matthew, there's a house right before you get to your house, that big two-story on the right. That thing went up for sale one time, and I'm going, Lisa, let's buy that. Come on, Lisa, come on. I want that house. She wouldn't have it. So I didn't get the house. But I'm like, okay, that was the first thing out of God's mouth, wasn't it? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Yeah. But he covets the throne of God. He's been there. He's seen it. He knows the power that it has. So thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. God did it. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. And this, again, this cannot be an earthly king of any kind. This has to be a spirit, an angel. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, I'm not positive on that interpretation. I'm not sure what that is. I've read some things over the years, and I'm not... I'm not convinced of it. One, one, um, one writer, he had a, a website up for years. Biblebelievers.org, I think is what it was. But anyway, um, nothing, nothing survives hell. But anyway, um, the stones of this, the, he theorized that the stones of fire were the planets. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't think that works. Um, possibly um, something around the throne of God. I'll have to, uh, I'm waiting on God to give me an idea of what that is. And so far he hasn't given it to me yet. Verse 15, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Underline that one word there, created. That's how you know Lucifer will not succeed in any of his plans other than what God allows him to. He is not the creator. He is the created. Man cannot withstand God. Angels cannot withstand God. They cannot defeat God. God is all powerful. God has all dominion. God has all authority. And like I say, when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19 and fights the battle of Armageddon, I think it's going to be the shortest war ever. It's just not going to last very long. He's just going to round them up, cast them in the lake of fire and say, see ya, cast the devil down in the pit for a thousand years. And that's the end of it. Well, almost the end of it. But anyway, perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, take all this together. 
you have, you have, uh, you have the devil, Lucifer. He's wiser than Daniel. His wisdom is perfect. His beauty is perfect. He is covered in all these precious stones here. He is the top cherub of all the angels of God. And how many angels are there? Innumerable company of angels. So he's the, he's the top one. He is, he, is, he is perfect in his music. He has the ability to create music, sounds. And if that sounds weird, think of what a cricket does. Or a bird. Just animals and insects in this world have the ability to make musical tones with their body. Crickets do it. They don't whistle. What do they do? Rub their legs together and make that sound. Okay? So then when you think of that and then think of Lucifer with all these instruments built into him, you go, okay, that's pretty cool. I get it now. So he was made that way and he is absolutely perfect he is full of beauty he's the top angel of everything and he has everything under him except the throne of god then iniquity was found in him what was the iniquity verse 16 by the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence. That's part of it. And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. There it is right there. Pride. Pride. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Uh, all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. And that matches what we saw in Isaiah uh, chapter 14. But thine heart was lifted up, in verse 17, because of thy beauty. That's pride. Whenever your heart is lifted up, you get to look, and he was looking at itself and saying, there isn't another angel like me. Boy, I must be really something super special. In fact, I am so special and I have so much wisdom and I have all these jewels and everybody is fascinated by me. Then I, I am destined for greatness. Sounds like a, um, somebody goes and makes positive speeches for people. Okay? Uh, the, you can be whatever you want to be, except God, <laughs> okay? But that's, that's how he got started. He was created. He was created perfect. He was created absolute. The, the sum of all things beautiful, he was. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. There wasn't a higher angel than he he had a multitude of wisdom, more than Daniel. He had, he had everything except God's throne. And that's what he wanted. And his pride, his heart lifted up because of his beauty. Well, what that did was all the wisdom that he had, his pride corrupted it. So it's like, he sees in the Bible prophecies concerning Jesus. But I think then he takes those and applies them to him. Like he is going to be the savior. He is going to be God. He is going to rule over everybody. He is going to sit in the temple of God and so on. And there he is in verse 18 again with, with traffic. Uh, he's a hustler. He's a dealer. Um... 
trafficking, anything illegal, weapons, alcohol, drugs, humans, slaves, things like that, anything illegal is a representation of Lucifer and his trafficking, and it's all about getting him gain, making him more wealthy and so on. We know God is the wealthy of us all, but then there is Lucifer who thinks that he can top that somehow, some way. You know, what's interesting about um, billionaires is that for the most part, they never stop wanting more money. Um, we know a, a pastor, Ellis Doyle, and he worked for Walmart there in Bentonville, Arkansas, and he knew Sam Walton. And Sam Walton, on his deathbed, his regret was he had plans to open up another store, and he was so sick and near death that he couldn't do it, and he regretted that he couldn't open up yet another Walmart somewhere. And that's how he left this world, apparently, was wanting more, wanting more. Um, Elon Musk wants more. I mean, he's doing things that supposedly are advancing mankind, okay, but he's making money in the process. He's not doing all this as a humanitarian, for the sake of the good of human species, he's making money. His plan to put thousands of satellites in the sky, Matthew saw this one night, didn't you? Thought it was, UFO, Dad, I got UFOs out of here. I said, no, it's Elon Musk. <laughs> he puts all these satellites, thousands of them, and his goal is to blanket the entire world with internet access. But he's not giving it away. It's $120 a month. I just installed mine the other day, <laughs> Friday, okay? It's better internet that I've ever had out there in the boonies. It is awesome, man. But anyway, um, he's, he wants to make more and more money. How did Elon Musk get started? PayPal, okay? PayPal was his idea to go along with... Um, Half my brain's gone for some reason. Huh? eBay, yeah. And that was how people were paying for their stuff on eBay. And uh, he makes a fortune doing that, but he's not content. So he comes up with these other businesses, like the Tesla and the rockets that he's building. But he's sending guys into space, but he's not doing it for free. He's getting paid by governments to put stuff up there. And then the Internet. He's going to blanket the world with Internet, but it's not free. You've got to pay for it. And um, so anyway, it's, it's typical of billionaires. They want to continue to make more and more and more and more. It's a sickness almost that they have. And I feel sorry for them. I do. I feel sorry for rich people who have all that money, but they're never satisfied and they're never content. And that, that's a manifest sign of who their spirit is, who their prince is. Their prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. So... This is how Satan started. This was his beginning. And uh, next through the next Sunday nights, we're going to look at the power that he has, uh, how much power he has, how that power is limited. Um, we're going to look at some of the things that he has done according to the scriptures, and then we're going to see his downfall. We already saw a part of it tonight. So let's stand to our feet. Just a quick word, <clears throat> the pursuit of money. And I know everybody has to have a job. Everybody has bills to pay. Everybody has to live and earn bread. But the pursuit of money uh, in this world is not a worthy cause. It's not something that will make you happy. Okay, If being a millionaire made a millionaire happy... They wouldn't be a millionaire for very long. They would just stop. I'm a millionaire. I made it, so I'm good. But it, like I say, they never, ever, ever stop. They always want more, want more, want more.
Solomon did. Solomon did, and his wisdom said that was vanity. It was vanity. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes up to our adversary. He is powerful, very powerful, but he's very evil. And, Lord, I've said this many times. I'd rather be guilty of just about any kind of sin, but not have pride. Because I know what pride leads to, according to the Bible. And I pray, dear God, that you would keep us humble, uh, keep us near the cross of Jesus, and uh, keep us away from pride or from prideful things in our life. Help us, dear God, that when we do earn our bread, when we earn our paycheck, a servant being worthy of his hire, Father, help us, dear God, to be careful not to make that the end and the aim and the goal of what our life is all about. Help us, dear God, to never forget those who don't have anything and to be willing to give for those, Lord, who need it. Father, we thank you for this word tonight. We ask you to bless us now. Give us knowledge and understanding of the days we live in. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.